Move over, sword. Today we're talking about the real king of this warfare jungle. The spear. Now remember, there are two things in life that will strike deep down into any Frenchman's heart. Number one, margarine. And number two, some old bald British dude with a pint in one hand, wearing a gravy stained Liverpool t-shirt and wearing a spear. <laughs> glory, glory, Man United. Suck it, Liverpool fans. Salutations Rangers, General Bradley 101 back at today with some more history. And in today's video, we are taking a look at the spear. Now you may be asking, why the spear? Because it's a goddamn best melee weapon ever invented by man. Period. And I will fight anyone on that. And in this video, I'm going to give you a history of a spear, explain why I think so, and eventually come to a terms where we just agree to disagree about whatever and just look at funny memes. Because at the end of the day, while anything can divide us, there's one thing that can always unite us, and that is the love and power of a good meme. Good meme. Anyway, my ramblings aside, let's crack on and take a look at the spear. So, the first ever record of the spear is well, since the first ever record of humanity has been discovered. Wood fire hardened spears, where essentially you would take saplings and you would stick them into the fire and you would carve them, stick them again, carve them, stick them again, so that eventually the tip would become pseudo charcoal-like and it was incredibly hard and dense and these were the first ever spears that were used for hunting primarily. But you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility that hey, if this can kill a pig, I think it can kill a man. You know, so we can assume that they were used for warfare. Eventually, during the later years, mankind discovered that, hey, stone was a very good material. And we see that stone and obsidian in particular around volcanic regions became a very commonplace tip instead of just a wood fire. In fact, the wood fire type disappeared entirely. It's, that's a common trend that you'll see with spears. When a better type of head is invented, the prior head disappears almost entirely, which makes sense, but still good to note. And these stone tips and these obsidian tips would actually be fixed together by either animal sinew or resin or some type of material, even like some types of mud and clay, depending. They Basically, if it's stuck there, you'd stick it onto your stick, then you have pointy stick. Pointy stick, good. And again, these were used for hunting and all types of warfare. But calling it warfare is very generous. It was probably just raids and skirmishes here or there with a, at most maybe like a dozen or two dozen men, give or take. But again, we see that with the spear, ever since its inception, it's been used as a weapon and a very effective weapon at that. I mean, early humanity used to hunt mammoths with this thing. So if it can take down a mammoth, you can take down a human. Then we come to the Bronze Age, around about 2000 BC, give or take. And that's when we get, surprising absolutely no one, bronze-tipped spears. And these were particularly common amongst every area, but the one area where they were most particularly common were the Proto-Greeks known as the Mycenaeans and their culture. Already we see the Proto-Greeks and what would known to become Greece, Macedonia, Thrace, developing this idea of the citizen soldier. When you think of spear and shield, you think of hoplite. So these are like the early beginnings of it. Also, fun fact, while most people believe that the Norse Vikings had horns on the helmets, they most definitely did not. And if they did, it was incredibly, incredibly like once off rare cases. The Mycenaeans and Proto-Greeks and well, proto balkanized people there, they actually have historical records of them putting horns on their helmets. So if you want a horned helmet, Mycenae in Greece. But here now we seem to see the different types of spearheads forming. Before they were just pointy stick because obsidian and stone, you can't really, they're not really that malleable. You know, you can't really just change them into a specific shape. They're actually very brittle as well, so you have to be careful of how you mold them. But with the introduction of bronze, we see that many different types of spearheads begin to form. As I said, with the Mycenaean, the leaf pattern shape was very popular, but there were many different types of spearhead that evolved. And from now on, any type of spearhead did in fact exist. You have incredibly long spears, incredibly thin spearheads, barbed spearheads, just anything really. Human imagination is something else. So any type of spearhead does exist. Though I would like to put one one little caveat here, while adding wing tips to a spear or other types of spikes is okay. If you add something like an axe head perhaps or a hammer head, it then changes to becoming a spear to becoming just a pole arm instead. While a spear is indeed a type of pole arm, for the purposes of this video, making a little distinction. And I put that in there because if you're like me, you want to create a fantasy setting that's pseudo realistic. So there you go. You're welcome. And then we come to the Iron Age. Now the Iron Age is really where we see the true like dominance of the spear. Again, we had previously in the Bronze Age, you know, the 
Greek Empire merged and the Macedonian Empire culminating in Alexander the Great and then the shattering of the Diadochi, the Greek phalanx was the end all and be all and that was at the end of the day a heavily armed and armoured shield and spear user using again iron tipped spears. And again we only see that falling when it gets to the time of the Romans who used arguably a type of spear themselves, well and not, well, not arguably, early on they were clad and armed as hoplites. I'm talking about the Hestati and the Principe, those who were armed with javelins which some do consider a type of spear it's a bit iffy a throwing spear well like, what's the difference between a throwing spear and a javelin not really much so yeah i personally consider the javelin to be a part of the spear family though if you do not i'd love to hear what you have to say down below it's always interesting to hear different sides of stories in god's history because it's one of those things where there is no definitive answer but it's not a big thing you know it's just like is this part of pointy stick or not part of pointy stick so it'd be fun let me know down below and we then come to the roman age and you know the imperium romanum however we see that the javelin and sword fighting of the romans would eventually transform back into a form of hoplite with the comitatensis being armed again with primarily heavy armor shields and spears and this would evolve into the eastern roman scutatoi sorry to backtrack this a little bit forgot to mention the comitatensis came around the fourth century third century give or take and the scutatoi from eighth century onwards give or take so heavy duty shield infantry. And we see that, that the idea of the spear never really went away. Even in Western Europe, for example, peasant militias were commonly armed with spears because like I said, they were cheap, easy to make, easy to use, easy to learn. And then we have the more elite guard. If they were not mounted, they fought on foot and they fought on foot, they would be armed with pole arms. You know, even in any aspect, really. Pole arms, like heavily armed infantry were armed with pole arms and in most cases shields. So the idea of the spear and shield warrior evolved and adapted, but never really went away. And again, we see this culminating as we reach the medieval age. As I said, the Byzantine Scutatoi was the, was the of the east it was the best infantry in all of the east and in the west peasant spear militias proved time and time again to be invaluable if well trained and equipped you know i often meme on the french but the flemish who were again and the swiss who came later on in the late medieval era were basically pseudo lightly armed peasant spear infantry and they were able to beat off heavy cavalry and heavy infantry the concept of a spear if the person is well trained not to mention well equipped they go on to dominate we see that again with the but going back to the Swiss Guard, their use of halberds and pikes eventually, what became what are known as the Swiss Square, which was essentially, like I said, you track back, Renaissance era pike formations were basically just pretty much a one-to-one -one of the Macedonian Sarissa Phalanx, except this time instead of being supported by slingers, they were supported by guns. Which is just mental to think about that. And again, we see the spear being prominently used throughout and this evolution as a pike to deal with heavy cavalry most likely, which was the bane of the medieval age, in the West at least. We go on from that and as we go from the Renaissance age to the gunpowder age, circa 18th century give or take, the spear didn't disappear, it was just combined with the handgunner, a bayonet. Some of the original rifles were quite long and some of the original bayonets were sword bayonets, you know, basically 45 centimeters give or take. They were quite long and they were used as pike formations as they were trained with spears. And we truly only see the spear start to, you know, go away as a type of formation round about World War One. There's an argument that the spear became less and less useful in the decades prior, which I will agree to, but the idea that the spear was no longer useful to you Humanity only set in after World War One, and that's when we got tanks and airplanes and machine guns, the arguably the first modern war. And that's where the spear and though the successor of the spear, the bayonet and the rifle, still exists today. And it's just crazy to me how thousands of thousands of thousands of years and we still have something that could be considered a short spear. Granted, that that's a big asterisk and a big if, but still. You know, I love the idea of something being carried throughout tradition. Just, it's really great. Anywho, that is the history of the spear. Now, let's go into different types of spears. Now, 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 now. Now, big disclaimer here. This is not anything official. This is just me and my own personal thing. I basically took a look at all the lengths of the spears throughout history, 
average them into these five categories. So understand something back in the day, they call a spear, spear. If it was a long spear, it was a long spear. If it was a short spear, it was a short spear. Take this as an idea. This is not the end all be all definitive guide. This is just something, hey, here's your reference point. So first thing first, we then come to the javelin. Now the javelin or throwing spear averages about 1.5 to 2 meters, give or take. And it, like I said, generally the tip is not as heavy. It is a little lighter or it could actually be the exact opposite in which the range is absolute malarkey except they put a giant metal ball at the tip to increase penetration like the Romans did with the peeler. That's one of two ways you could go about it. We then have the short spear which is about two meters give or take or just above the height of a man. Now these were particularly used by the Norse and Scandinavians. Vikings love their short spears and these could indeed be used as throwing spears. And then we come to the regular spears which is about 2.5 meters give or take there and about. Uh, the Greek dory was used as this and like i said the hoplite it's the quintessential spear and shield user we then come to long spears which are basically three meters plus these are my preferred spear because it gives you a lot more reach and you know it's a lot easier to deal with cavalry but it's still not too unwieldy as a pike that it's useless in one-to-one -one or loose water formation and then we come to the pike now the pike is an extra long spear that requires two hands to use you need two hands to do this thing because it can be up to four meters long and if the longest pike ever with the Macedonian Sarissas at 6 plus meters. For reference, that's about 3.5 times the height of an average sized man. Now you'll be asking why didn't I put it in freedom units? Well, because mm, fuck you, America. That's why. I mean, I don't understand. It's like every time I, I, I get a recipe and it's like, use three cups of flour. Like, what cup? Whose cup? Why would I have the same cup that you have? I don't understand. And Lord, don't get me started on ounces. Ounces, 28.394 grams, liters, milli- Why, why do y'all gotta be so special? I don't get it, I do not understand. It's just, just, gack. Anyway, back to pointy bits. Like I said, that's just a brief overview of the different kinds of spears. We talked about the longest spear being the uh, Sarissa and the shortest was actually the Asagai. Now, I mean, there's different ways how you pronounce it and different names for it, but created by the great Caesar of Africa himself, Shaka Zulu. One of my favorite monarchs, and uh, yes, that is my bias to being a South African. And this is interesting because it was actually a combination of a short sword and a spear. The blade length being 0.3 meters, literally a third of the blade, a third of the spear, I beg your pardon. So spears can be quite literally anything, really. They could be any type of spears. A particular noting is Chinese and Asian style spears often had hooks on them that would be used to pull down cavalry or like spikes in certain areas that could be used as a matter. Now, as I said, spearheads could be any anything really. You have literal anything so long as they don't have like a, a large metal protrusion. If it's a large spike on it, you're going into pole arm territory. If it's a large hammer or an axe, power territory, etc. The only exceptions would be like wings. Spike wings are okay or you could go the Asian route and have hooks to quite literally yoink off heavy cavalry. But yeah, that has been the spear, ladies and gentlemen. Not that much to talk about. For such an iconic weapon, it is incredibly simple, but that's the beauty of it, how simple it is. And I've always said this and I always will say it. The best form of infantry is a heavy infantry armed with a shield, spear, and a short sword that is trained in fighting in both close order formation with the spear or loose order formation with the saber. Basically a combination of the Roman legion and the Greek phalanx, which, yes, that does give me a history boner. The idea that's so iconic of us, again, it is sort of ingrained in our brain and in our DNA, but the idea of the heavily armed, clad spearmen marching forward, devastating the enemy and withstanding any charge is just so iconic and just so bloody cool. There you go. There's the spear in all its wonderful glory. So comment down below. What's your favorite type of spear or polearm? Do you agree with me that the combination of the Roman legion and Greek phalanx is a plausible or do you think that's better just to keep to one and support the weaknesses with other units comment down below let me know whatever you want like share subscribe do all that wonderful stuff if you indeed like this but i have been general bradley 101 you have been beautiful awesome and amazing people thank you all so very much for watching and stay loyal out there boys and girls dismiss rangers I just, I don't understand. It's like, not not only do you measure in like ounces, right? And then like fluid liters, but then Fahrenheit, 
Why? Why? Why is that? I remember the first time I ever saw Fran, I was like, it's going to be 65 degrees today. I nearly had a bloody heart attack. I thought it was going to be cooked alive.